This is Ria. Welcome to Little Stories for Tiny People. Friends, if you recall, we are in the middle of a two-part story. Today, we get to hear part two of a cat story. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to jump in. If you haven't already listened to part one, go do that now. Okay, quick recap. In A Cat Story Part 1, Cat escaped from his human box to live as a wild cat. Things did not go that well, and Part 1 ended with a shocking revelation about the colonel. Cat retreated to the woods to figure out his next move. Okay, we have a lot to get to. So, take it away, Emily. Remember, there are no pictures. You have to imagine the pictures in your mind. You can imagine them however you want. Okay, here we go. Cat woke up with a jolt. He could feel something crawling up his leg. He looked down and saw... A ladybug. The ladybug was entirely unbothered by Cat, even as he started shaking his leg to throw it off. Cat had only seen ladybugs a few times and had no idea if they were poisonous. Uh, could you get off me, please? Oh, is this your leg? My eyes are going. I thought it was a very mossy log. My most sincere apologies. The ladybug flew off Cat, landed nearby, and continued walking. Cat stretched and yawned. His neck was sore from sleeping in a weird position. His fur was rumpled. It took him a second to remember why he was outdoors, in the forest, and not on his rug. Oh, right. I'm wild now. It took him another second to remember Colonel Cuddles and the chipmunk and the human person. Cat felt the confusion settle back into his mind. Why did he lie to me? Answers. That was what he needed. But he also needed food. Cat scowled as he remembered his hunting failures the night before. He needed a real meal. And the only cat who might be able to help him get one was nowhere near the woods. Cat jumped to his feet and headed off through the trees. He found Sasha quicker than he expected. She was digging in a trash can, not far from where they'd met, in the middle of the city. Cat opened his mouth to get Sasha's attention, but something leapt into it. Something moving. Ew. Cat was hungry, but he was not a fool. He spat the thing out onto the sidewalk. It was a wolf spider. Blah. Some cats don't mind spiders, but Cat was not a fan. Too crunchy. Also too many shoelaces. Cat noticed the wolf spider was holding a tiny laptop. What's your ID number? My what? Name? Uh, Cat. Oh my. Okay, Cat. Let me see if you come up in the database. Sorry for jumping in your mouth, by the way. I've found it's the best way to get Cat's attention. You all are a strange sort. Always looking off into the distance with an air of superiority. You, with just four legs and your big slow brains. The wolf spider tapped away on his tiny keyboard. As I thought, you are not on the list for this trash district. Uh, I'm not sure I... Cat, you're back. Oh my gosh, did you come back to hang out with me? This is so exciting. Did you see any wolves? Sasha came over and stood next to Cat. Reggie, he's with me. He's my new friend we met the other day at dumpster number 2271, and we really clicked. Sasha's whiskers were caked with frosting from a half-eaten donut. 
The wolf spider was not amused. He's not on the list. And I've told you, call me Reginald. Okay, I'll try to remember that. But do you remember last week I saved you from that bat that wanted to eat you? Remember how I went right up to the bat and I said, Get out of here, you bat, and leave my friend Reggie alone because he doesn't want to be eaten today. Or ever, I think. At least I would never want to be eaten by a bat. I guess you might feel differently. I don't know, but you sure seemed happy when he flew away. Do you remember that? Reginald scowled. (sighs) I remember. The spider looked around, as if there might be someone watching them. Fine. He's got five minutes. And it's Reginald. Hear that, cat? And next time you come into this district without proper permissions... Okay, thanks, Reggie. Oops, I mean Reginald. The wolf spider grumbled to himself and scurried up the side of the nearest building. Don't mind him. He seems really angry and dissatisfied with his life, but I think it's just a friend. Cat's mind filled with questions. Why was a wolf spider guarding trash cans? How were the trash districts organized? Did all the street cats have to get permission to eat from them? Who gave them permission? And how could he go about trying to get it? But Cat's stomach growled loudly, and he only had five minutes. So he decided to stick with why he came in the first place. I'm starving. Come on, I know where the good stuff is. With a flick of her tail, Sasha motioned for Cat to follow her to a trash can down the block. You would not believe a human stir away. It's bananas. I don't really like bananas. Oh, Cat, you're funny. Here you go. Sasha dragged out a half-eaten cheeseburger and tossed it to Cat. Cat lunged at it and tore it apart. Sasha scrounged around and dragged out some dirty chicken nuggets. Some tiny human must have dropped these on the ground. Like I said, can't get over what these people throw away. They're really weird about dirt. It's like they don't want to eat it or something, but dirt has lots of good stuff in it. You know what I mean? But humans do have really big, slow brains. So you have to forgive them for not thinking all this through. They're doing their best, is what Paul says. Of course, he does make up a lot of stories, so I don't really go by what Paul says. They spent the next few minutes eating. Cat felt full quickly, his stomach having shrunk in the past couple of days. Thank you, seriously, Cat said when he'd finished. You're so welcome. The sun was out, and the two felines stretched out on a sunny strip of sidewalk. Cat's mind went a little fuzzy from the food and the sun. He winked his eyes closed. So where do you usually get your food? Sasha peered at Cat with a curious look. What do you mean? Well, the human trash is good and all, but where do you get most of your food? This is where I get all of my food. Cat opened his eyes and looked at her. All of your food? But don't you catch mice? Don't you, you know, hunt? Sasha nodded, finally understanding. Sometimes I do, but it's hard to get enough food that way. Nearly impossible. Cat looked at Sasha's thin frame. As a house cat, she'd be considered terribly underweight. A stark new thought dropped into Cat's mind. You rely on people, don't you? Cat asked, sitting up straight. People? Yeah, loads of people. A whole city full. Without them, it would be hard to find food and water because they make the pond I drink out of. Also, once I found this teeny hat, and it fit on my head. It's really, really hard to find hats my size. Also, by the way, it's really hard to find suspenders that fit me. And even when I do, I don't have pants, so it makes it really tricky to use the suspenders. Anyway, I wouldn't have any of that stuff without the people. Cat looked around, as if seeing the city for the first time. Impossibly tall buildings... Flat roads filled with wheel boxes, all made by people. Hmm. So, it's not that much different than what I had. I relied on two humans. You rely on a city full. Oh, wow, yeah, 
what an interesting connection to make. Same deal, more humans. Plus rain, snow, ice. Have you seen ice? It's a nightmare. Paul tells me it's made of water, but I don't see how that could be true, and I've told you how he makes up stories, so. Oh, and let's see, no heat, no regular meals, no, let me guess, refrigerators. I've seen them being taken out of trucks. You get to sit inside those on really hot days, right? Not exactly. No pillows, no treats, none of those little mouse toys, no doctors when you're sick, no hairdressers, no laser shows, no catnip. What are those? Sasha asked, her ears perking up. Oh, uh, never mind. They sat in silence for a moment. Cat opened his mouth to speak, but something leapt into it. He spat it out. It was Reginald again. I said five minutes. Relax, Reggie. Oh, sorry, Reginald. Does it look like we're anywhere near a trash can? He cannot be in this district without proper permissions. And trust me, fella, I will be filling out an incident report with your name on it. So good luck getting permissions in this town anytime soon. I'm on my way out, Cat said. Cat, you don't have to. It's fine. I have somewhere to be, anyway. And thank you. For the food, and for the rest. And thank you, Reginald. Before Sasha could protest further, Kat strode down the street and was lost in the thicket of humans on the city sidewalk. As he left, he heard Reginald stamping his eight little feet on the ground. Kat padded through the streets, his belly full and his head swimming. How was the wildest cat he knew, the one who scrounged for food and slept outside, just as dependent on people as he had been? As Cat made his way out of the city and back into the tree-lined neighborhood, he remembered the colonel. He had to find someone who might help him make sense of what he'd seen the night before. He had an idea of who that someone might be. As Cat approached the Duchess's sunroom, he heard the sound of little feet running. The chipmunk guard scrambled through Cat's legs, holding his golden flag. Ahem, who goes there? You don't remember me? I was just here the other day. I repeat... Who goes there? Quince, your hollering has damaged the very delicate hairs in my inner ear. Go be of use. Some of the shrews have kicked their precious books past the due dates. You must collect them at once. With penalties, you know what that requires. Yes, Duchess. The chipmunk scampered off. (sighs) Hard to believe, but he's much more useful than my last guard. Uh, what, what happened to your last guard? I ate him. Cat gulped, momentarily forgetting that he was a cat with sharp claws and not a chipmunk. The Duchess let out one of her long, strange laughs. I'm joking. You're quite serious, aren't you? My last god did not collect overdue penalties from the shrews with any regularity. I banished him. Uh huh. Cat suddenly remembered he had come to speak with the Duchess by choice. Uh, I came to talk to you. I thought you might have some insights to offer. The Duchess's piercing green eyes gleamed at this. Cat was about to speak further when they were interrupted by the Duchess's human. He padded into the room wearing woolen slippers and went over to the bookshelf. Could have sworn I left that book right here. The Duchess locked eyes with Cat and raised a brow. Then she let out a severe meow. Meow! And the human scurried from the room. Uh, that 
book he's looking for. The shrews have it. I see. Well, you said you needed my... insights. Yes. Do you happen to know the colonel? The duchess sighed as if it took (sighs) great energy to care about this conversation. We are acquainted. Then you know that he's a part-timer, yes. The duchess began cleaning herself. A part-timer? He rules over his dominion part of the time. The rest of the time he prowls. His word, not mine. I do not prowl. It is most undignified. Cat thought back to when he met the colonel after falling asleep under the wheel box. When I met him, he made it sound like no cat should ever live in a human box. But I know he does. I don't get it. I see. You poor dear. This must be terribly confusing for you. Allow me to explain in words you may understand. The things cats say and the things cats do don't always line up. It's cat nature. Sorry, what what was that last word? Cat nature. The nature of cats. My apologies, I did say I would use words you'd understand. It's hard to remember how very little you understand. Cat gave a weak smile. Cats have a tendency to say one thing and do another. But why? Why would the colonel talk about house cats the way he did when he knew he'd be sleeping in a warm bed that night? Mm, Perhaps he's conflicted about his station life. Not all who are born into royalty feel comfortable with the responsibility. As they say, with great power comes great responsibility to preside over shrews and their precious books. You think he's conflicted? Life is not either or. Life takes place in the great in-between. At that moment, Quincy arrived, swaying beneath a stack of books atop his head. Quincy, I take it you collected the appropriate overdue penalties from the shrews. Yes, Duchess. Good. There are no exceptions. They are either on time or late. No in-between. Cat felt a headache coming on. He said his goodbyes and found himself back on the sidewalk. He still had no answers after all this. His mind went to Sasha, who lived her whole life outdoors, free but scrounging for food from passersby. He thought of the colonel, who was wild one minute and a lap pet the next. And he thought of the duchess, who lived a life confined to a human box but who reigned over both humans and animals alike. Which one of them was doing it right? When Cat had set out on this adventure, he knew, just knew, he was meant to be wild. But now, he was no longer sure what that even meant, or whether it was the right path at all. Cat trotted down the street. He had no idea where to go, or what to do next. He looked up at the sky, the endless sky, the sky that on that first day seemed like it could swallow him up into a great blue eternity. I need a sign, he said. Universe, please. I don't know what to do. Just give me a sign. And as he lowered his eyes from the clouds above, he saw... A sign.
It was attached to a tree. It said, Beloved cat, lost. Cat felt a lump form in his throat as he moved closer to the tree. There was a mailbox next to it, and he leapt on top so he could look at the sign. There was a picture of a cat. It was a tabby cat with an M pattern on its forehead and swirling stripes going down its side and through its tail. The cat had big, searching eyes. Its fur looked sleek and well-maintained. Beneath its picture, there was a name. Whiskers. Cat blinked. His eyes felt itchy. He shook his head from side to side and kept reading. Our much-beloved, darling, brown tabby cat, Whiskers, Whiskers is missing. missing. He's an expert at getting out of a collar, so we stopped trying to make him wear one. Instead, you'll recognize him by the white blotch on his left back foot. He's the sweetest cat you'll ever meet, but also fiercely independent and clever. Whiskers may run away from you, but if you are able to reach him, he enjoys head scratches. Just don't touch his tummy or under his chin. If you see Whiskers, Please return him to us. He helped me get through a very oh, difficult yeah, time in my life last year. Time in my life I last miss him year. and I miss him terribly. He's an important member. He's an important member of our family. There was a number to text, an email address, a fax number, a pager number, and a street address. Cat looked down at himself. His matted fur had been swept in all directions by the wind, but he could still see the swirling stripes down his side. He swiveled his head to look at his back left foot, where there was indeed a white blotch covering his paw. Cat tried to make sense of the sign. Fiercely independent, important member of our family. Cat thought back to last year, He hadn't thought much of it at the time, but now he could remember his human crying a lot. She'd let him sleep next to her for months, which was a treat. She was always calling him over, whiskers, having him sit with her on the couch in her lap. Cat hadn't understood that she was extra affectionate because she needed him. This was new information. Cat had lived in a human box for years, understanding that he relied on them. He needed them to survive, and he kind of resented it. He had never understood that they relied on him. They didn't need him for food or water or to scratch them behind the ears. That would be funny. No, apparently they needed him for love. In all of his travels the last few days, Cat had spoken to three very different felines with three very different perspectives on life. Not one of them had mentioned love. Cat realized none of these cats had all the answers, and none of them could fully answer the questions he had about his own life. Cat looked into the eyes of the cat on the sign. He felt like he was seeing himself for the first time. He did look fiercely independent. He did look clever. Cat jumped down from the mailbox. That was a few weeks ago. Now, Cat sits on his window perch, watching a plane trace across the sky. He feels a light breeze drift through his fur. Few days after his return, he taught himself how to crack open the window, just a touch to feel closer to the outdoors. Cat also has some new entertainment. While he was missing, his human person got creative. She put a hummingbird feeder right outside Cat's favorite window, hoping it would draw him back home. When he did come back, she believed it was because of the bird feeder. 
Kat allowed her, with her big slow brain, to continue believing that. Only he knows the whole story. Kat's human box no longer feels like a place he needs to escape. It feels like home base. A place to relax between adventures. Because, yes, Kat still goes on adventures. He makes it out of the house at least once a week to lie in the sun, to glare at caterpillars, to paw at stink bugs, to prowl. He learned a new trick just a couple days ago. There's a trellis that he can climb up to get on the roof of the human box. On a warm afternoon, there is no better place to lounge than on those sun-baked shingles. From up there, Cat can gaze up at the endless sky, watching the clouds. He can look out at the woods and sometimes glimpse deer dipping their heads to eat leaves. On top of a human-built structure, he has found a commanding perch. He relishes these moments. He drinks them up. He gets his fill for about 45 minutes. And then he slips inside. Sometimes he still has feelings of being locked in. When he feels that way, he channels the Duchess. We are royalty. He tells himself he's a prince. Cat looks upon his humans and nods his head. Yes, I shall allow these people to serve me once more. They stoop to refresh his water bowl. I presume that is filtered water, he thinks. I shall taste it. And if it is not, I shall drink from the toilet bowl instead, Cat says, not knowing how water works. When he is feeling powerless, Cat reminds himself he has the power to cause certain people's eyes to swell shut simply by being near them. Cat still rolls his eyes when dogs stride by, heads held high, jauntily leading their owners down the sidewalk. You will never get to chase that rabbit, Cat thinks. He keeps a lookout for any more cats on leashes, but he hasn't seen any. Maybe the humans are capable of learning. On one of Cat's adventures, as he drinks from a stream and cleans himself, a small house cat wanders over, looking anxious. First time out, huh? Cat says. Is it that obvious? You reek of vanilla. Cat could see the house cat turning something over in her mind. Is this the better life? She says. Being out here? Cat sighs and looks up at the clouds. I can't answer that for you. All I can say is be grateful and stay wild in spirit. I've got an email. I think I know what this one is about. Oh yes, it's from the Studio Spiders. Probably pleased with me that I included a spider with a laptop. Okay, let's see. Dear Rhea, how could you? Wait, what? How could you? Wolf spiders do not use laptops. They are well known to be critical of new technology. They use typewriters. Everyone knows this, except apparently you. Luckily for you, because they do not use digital products, it is highly unlikely any wolf spiders will hear this story. But we will tell them about it because how could we not? You will undoubtedly receive a slew of angry typewritten letters delivered to your, you know what, all right, I think we get the point. Let's skip to the end here. Blah, blah, blah. Sincerely and with great disappointment, the Studio Spider and Beetle Guild. Well, thank you for these corrections. I just want to emphasize that these stories are fiction. They're imaginary, wolf spiders and all. I see you glaring at me. Maybe I need to get a new email address. 
Anyway, I hope you loved this story. It was a challenge to finish, but I'm so glad I did. Someday, you may decide to go off into the world to find something. Whatever you are looking for, your life's purpose, an answer to a big question, the perfect lightweight jacket, whatever it is, I hope you find it, even if you end up back where you started. Little Stories for Tiny People is written, performed, and produced by me, Rhea Pector. Peter Kay runs my website and puts my stories on the internet for all of you to enjoy. Big thanks to the listeners who provided sound effects used in this story. Thank you to Simone, Cassie, Shay, Nora, Aubrey, Ivy, Alon, and Ty. And a big thanks to Emily for providing this super important reminder message at the beginning. I also just want to say I am blown away by all of your kindness, your encouragement, and your appreciation for my work. I truly have the best audience ever. And if you are so inclined, please share this story with all self-professed cat ladies in your life, all chipmunk guards, and your friends, both with and without cat allergies. They just might need a good story these days. And thank you, as always, for listening in.